The RimWorld standoff of 2650 is often viewed as the end of the so-called good years. While the Star League as a whole was still growing in strength, cracks were starting to form in the facade of Unity, particularly within the Dragoners Combine. However, it was the Free Worlds that would next fall into crisis, with the emergence of a terror cell that almost spelled the end for House Marek altogether. In 2667, the scourge of death emerged on the scene with the terrorist bombing of an Atreus starport. This group was strongly opposed to the feudal societies that had emerged as a necessity of early space colonization. With the emergence of the HPG technology, they sought to bring an end to the Great Houses, including both the ruling Marix and House Cameron of the Star League, both of whom were perceived to be holding the Free Worlds back. Other attacks followed soon after, but it was their targeting of the Marek family estate that made them infamous. Terence Marek led the Free Worlds during this time of peace, adopting the title of Warden of the Perimeter Defences as opposed to Captain General. He was conducting a meeting of the Dormouth Council when a bomb planted beneath the library exploded, killing 39, the Warden and many of his close family among them. One individual who survived the blast, though only barely, was Gerald Marek, General of the 3rd Marek Militia. His prognosis wasn't good, but he clung to life, and through the extensive use of bionics was able to make a recovery. As the most senior member of the family left, he was sworn in as the new Captain General, and promptly made the extermination of the Scourge of Death his main priority. To that end, he massively expanded the Free World's intelligence agency, SAFE. Many civil liberties were sacrificed in the pursuit of the terrorists, and while initially he had public support and sympathy, this began to wane over time. As the first 10 years of his rule were coming to an end, Parliament was considering removing him from office. There were even some who claimed that the extent of his bionic implants had impaired his judgement and he could not even be classified as human anymore. This anti-bionic phenomena continues within the free worlds to this day, largely as a result of Gerald's actions. A major breakthrough happened in 2679 with the discovery of a Scourge base on Westover. Sifting through the compound, safe agents made a shocking discovery. They had stumbled upon near irrefutable proof that the Scourge of Death had received significant financial backing from House Salage. Gerald called the three leading members of the family to Atreus to stand trial, but unsurprisingly, none attended. On October 1st, 2679, the Salage family was tried in absentia, found guilty of treason, and sentenced to death. When the Salage family ordered the provincial forces to prepare for war, the High Council could see a civil war was in the offing. The Lyran Archon and Compelling Chancellor urged the First Lord to commit the SLDF to the fight to prevent it from getting out of control. However, Marek and Cameron saw their pleas for what they were, a pretense to get their own militaries moving across the border and seize any vulnerable worlds, in the name of defence of course. Jedal Manik was able to win the argument and received assurances that the SLDF would not become engaged and only provide humanitarian aid in the aftermath. He subsequently dispatched the Marek militia to Helos Minor, where they began the fight with the regular Hussars. It was a short campaign, as many of those fighting for Salaj were questioning their loyalties to the house that had seemingly funded and encouraged domestic terrorism. Harmony fell soon after, and by December, Gerald was preparing to advance on Regulus itself. The surviving members of the Salaj family did not wait around any longer, and in the new year up and left the Free Worlds entirely, taking their vast fortunes with them out into the Magistracy. Those left behind were imprisoned or executed. In their place, House Shank was elevated to the position of Duke of Regulus. Because the situation had not come to a conclusive end, House Salaj had escaped after all, Gerald could continue to cast them as a grave threat to the stability of the League and justify his continued suppression of personal liberties and expansion of safe. The Free Worlds was, in effect, becoming a police state. The Principality of Regulus would never be the same again. What had once been a founding member of the League was broken into three distinct districts, the two new ones being the Regulum Free States and Rim Collective. The Principality itself became a federal protectorate, but this decision opened the door to a different kind of political upheaval. The proliferation and success of the Lamarth water purification process had resulted in a great many new colonies being established across the Inner Sphere. One of these was the Camlin system in the Regulum Principality. Camlin now sought separation from Regulus and admission to the Free Worlds Parliament as an independent world. The Free Worlds League in 2588 consisted of eight provinces, two of which were less than a decade old, and a number of small independents, very few of which were powerful enough to have much sway in Parliament. 
Most of the provinces voted in blocs, and naturally they had goals and desires that were counter to what the Marrocks wanted. As a way to diminish their power, the judicial courts granted Camelon's request to break away from Regulus, citing in their argument the three border worlds that had swapped between the Magistracy and the League during the Reunification War. This led to a period of balkanisation for the League, which has continued ever since. The Duchy of Orloff had existed in an unofficial capacity for some time, House Orloff had been raising and fighting with their own provincial units since the Reunification War. In 2691, they separated from Orient. They maintained good relations with House Allison even after the split. The Principality of Gibson would further divide the old Regulan state at the turn of the century, and the Abbey District would unify as a military dictatorship not long afterwards. The Free Worlds today has more than a hundred provinces, some no bigger than a continent. Since the Council Edict of 2650 came into effect, many of the Great Houses were forced to retire large chunks of their militaries. Particularly hard hit by this were the Draconis Combine. They got around this restriction by encouraging those soldiers to sign up as private security for businesses and bodyguards for the rich and powerful. In this way, the Combine can requisition additional troops and equipment at short notice without technically surpassing the limits imposed by Directive 30. As the fascination with ancient Japanese culture grew within the populace, it became popular, and later mandatory, for graduates of the more prestigious military academies to wear or be awarded with ceremonial wakazashi and katana. Those soldiers, with little better to do during times of peace, began to organise duels amongst themselves. Eventually, this grew into a formal tournament system, with each regiment having a champion who would go out to challenge other neighbouring champions. In addition, there were many so-called ronin, champions who were without an official place in the roles of the DCMS. Over time, these duels transitioned from sword fighting to mech battles. In August 2681, Amanda Kuzunoya, the champion of the 3rd Benjamin regulars, approached the SLDF base on planet, Fort Chandra, and challenged the best mech warrior inside to come out and face her in battle. She stood vigil for 10 days, repeating her challenge until the 23rd, when Lieutenant Bradley Grebers disobeyed orders and walked his mech out to meet her. A short, frenetic battle took place before the fortress walls, one that ultimately left Grebers' mech disabled. Kuzunoya marched over, raised her weapon, and fired directly into the cockpit, executing the lieutenant. This began a series of similar duels, all ending in defeat for the SLDF, with several other mech warriors dying in the process. First Lord Michael Cameron tried to talk Heroes and Curator into ordering those champions to stop issuing challenges, but the coordinator's response was to claim that they were no longer under his employ, and that the rise in dueling had come about as a result of the Council Edict. Operation Cowbird began on March 12th the following year. Again, a Curator champion approached and challenged an SLDF officer to a duel, only this time, an elite lance of mechs rushed the Draconis Combine Marauder and swiftly disabled it, after which it was hurried off planet for inspection. Their orders to do so had come from the Star League Intelligence Corps, who were convinced that the Curitans had developed some new technology that would account for the string of defeats suffered by the SLDF. Unfortunately for them, upon dismantling it, they discovered that there was no new tech. It was simply the superior skills of the Combine mech warriors that made them unbeatable in one-on-one -on -one combat. To counter this, the SLDF established the Advanced Combat Maneuvering Skills Program on July 7, 2682, the first elite mech warriors graduating the next summer. The initiative would later become better known as the Gunslinger Program. While the Star League built up a reserve of trained duelists, they issued strict orders to their units not to engage the DCMS or any other Curitan champions. The peace was broken on Christmas Day 2687, when one of the first graduates of the program, Colonel Donovan Fresnel of the 75th Royal Hussars Regiment, faced off against Chusa Shinichi Konya of the 5th Benjamin Regulars on Minakuchi, the bout ultimately ending in a draw. As the regularity of the contest grew more frequent, it drew an increasing amount of public attention. Many news and entertainment programs, particularly in the Dragonus Combine, reported on events as if it was a sport. What many failed to realise was that this was not a friendly competition between member states, but a full-on undisclosed war over supremacy and ideology, with casualties eventually numbering more than a thousand. Perhaps the most famous and successful of the Star League champions was Colonel Daniel Allison of the 29th Royal Dragoons, whose first victory on Annapolis in 2702 ended a string of 31 unbroken victories for the Combine. He continued as his unit's champion for some years, retiring in 2742 with 59 victories to his name. There were some Rekuritans who had achieved over 70 dueling victories, including sword fights, but unlike the SLDF, 
they were also challenging their rivals from within their own military, therefore it is impossible to conclusively say who was the greatest champion. These duels would retroactively become known as the first hidden war of the Star League. There is some debate on how long this war lasted, or whether it even classifies as a war at all. The most comprehensive histories put the date of the last contest as being fought on December 13th, 2738. By this point, relations had completely broken down between the Terran hegemony and Draconis Combine. Two quiet years followed, during which time the coordinator was issuing new orders to his Ronin warriors. Curita would push for the return of dueling soon after, but these later bouts were more commonly associated with another conflict. Some reports point to events in 2751 as the true end of the First Hidden War, where again violence between Cameron and Curita would briefly cease. But even then, the culture had become thoroughly ingrained by that point, and the duels would unofficially continued for another 15 years. The Gunslinger program ultimately proved effective in levelling the playing field, as in the final count, 49% ended with the DCMS the winner, while the SLDF was the victor in 47% of the duels, with the remainder ending in draws. This conflict was a slow burn, smouldering for over 50 years, during which time a number of other crises rocked the Inner Sphere. The end of the 27th century marked the end of the peaceful détente between the member states and their periphery associates. Though the ruling Camerons and Curitans were at odds, the citizens of both realms were enjoying the good times that the Star League had brought, as were all the others. Civil liberties had been curtailed in the Free Worlds and Capellan Confederation, but the average person was little affected by this change. Even the periphery was getting along well. One poll taken in 2665 within the Torian Concordat showed that remarkably the Camerons were more popular than the Calderons, and this was not because of any unpopularity on the part of Protector Consuela Calderon. In fact, her council peers voted her as the Star League's second lord in 2663, and she became the sole periphery leader to chair a meeting in the High Council four years later, the only time that this would happen in the history of the League. Unfortunately, at the turn of the century, there was a sickness at the heart of the Union that would lay the foundations for the upcoming disaster. Jonathan Cameron became First Lord on October 13th, 2690. Nobody knew it at the time, but Jonathan was plagued with visions of the collapse of the Star League in House Cameron. His undiagnosed mental illness meant his time in office led the League down a dark path of military build-up, a military his father Michael had been considering reducing immediately before his death. Directive 33 sent military spending through the roof. This led to a great many technological breakthroughs, a full list would be beyond the scope of this video. Many were the work of R&D director Ramve Gangestad, but the most important advancement to come from this period was the space defence system. This network of automated ground and naval batteries was built around many key hegemony worlds and was an almost unassailable wall of anti-warship defences. The technology within the STS was as close as humanity has ever come to developing true artificial intelligence, a feat that hasn't been matched in the centuries since. Unfortunately, this arms build-up was one of the first pieces of legislation that drove a wedge between the Inner Sphere and the Periphery. Both had to endure a rise in taxes, but this was harder on those fringe worlds and was viewed as an unnecessary expense. Enticed by promises that the new military tech would proliferate into their own armies, the Great Houses were more amenable to the hegemony's new weapons. The divide between periphery and core nations became greater when the member states passed Directive 41 in 2722. Proposed as a way for the periphery to reclaim more control over their economies, the idea was for the BSLA checks and controls to be removed. What this actually opened the door to was for the Innisfere mega corporations to move in and ransack dozens of worlds of all their resources, then depart for greener pastures, leaving the local community and economy in ruins. The Periphery Freedom Movement was founded the following year, and was over a million members strong within a decade. A ticking clock had started up. Over the next few years, the state of affairs in the periphery only deteriorated, and before long, the many protests had turned violent, this situation came to a head on June 15th, 2733, on the Torian world of New Ganymede. The police were trying to disperse the crowd when they came under fire from unknown assailants. They promptly called in the Mech Garrison, but this only escalated things further, and before long, a firefight had broken out. In the end, over a hundred civilians were killed, and hundreds more wounded. This unfortunate event repeated itself on the Outworlds Alliance planet Savon the following year, where dozens more were killed. In the aftermath of these events, the SLDF Commanding General received a distressing report from Admiral Norumboli, the Director of Naval Planning and Strategy Subcommand. The document, known as the Hyacinth Hawk Pitcairn Pressage, warned that if something was not done to reduce periphery tensions, 
either Savon or the Torian world of New Vandenberg would secede from the Star League by 2745 and likely trigger a major war in doing so. Regrettably, no action was taken to correct the Star League's dangerous course, as the last decade had seen far greater calamities than the protests out in the periphery.